Okay, yes. <laughs> Um, thanks, it's so great to see you all this evening and um, we've got an amazing lineup of speakers for you. Um, in a minute I'll ask them all to introduce themselves. Um, just a couple of things from me, so I'm Carolyn Keenan, I, I know I've met quite a few of you. Um, welcome back for those of you who, who are coming back um, to a different session. So yeah, so this is our how to, um, one, in, one in a series and it's obviously how to start an app business. Uh, just a couple of things that we've got. <laughs> Um, coming up, hopefully you've all now seen our link tree. That's where we put any new things, to, you know, and obviously um, events that are coming up. Um, our, tomorrow we've got an event um, about how to build a no-code app. So we've got um, Zubair who's coming in. He, he's um, a specialist in using um, Bubble. So he's going to be actually, you'll, you'll be physically bringing your laptops and you'll be physically building the, the start of um, your own app. And then we've got another workshop on the 26th of October and that's about how to, once you come up with an idea, it's about how, sort of testing it, validating, validating it, working through it. So those are both Wednesday afternoon sessions. Um, and then we've got one more this term in our how-to series, and that's how to, we call it, change the world through business. Essentially, it's sort of mission purpose-led businesses or social enterprises, and we'll, again, like tonight, we'll have a, a panel of some fantastic speakers. Um, and then the only other thing really to highlight is our Apollo program. So for those of you who've been inspired by some of these events and are coming up with some ideas of your own or problems that you want to solve, um, Apollo would be a really great program for you to um, just learn a bit more about starting up a business in the UK. Four week program on a Wednesday afternoon. If you go onto that link tree um, and click on Apollo, it'll take you through to a very short application form. Um, you don't have, you know, we're not looking for people with fully formed business ideas, but just people who are interested in finding out more. Um, the only other thing I wanted to highlight is um, Slido. So you, I think you might, have, I know someone's already put a question up, but if, on, um, if you scan the QR code on the screen or on the piece of paper in front of you, it gives you the opportunity to write some questions. Of course, at the end or even, even through it, you can put your hand up and ask in the traditional way. But as we're talking about apps and tech, um, we've got Slido. And sometimes people don't feel comfortable in saying the question out loud. They'd rather just write it down. So at the end, I think Kath will be going through some of the questions um, so, yeah, if you want to, to make use of that tool, it's really quite, quite useful. So, um, without further ado, we'll get on to the, what you've all come for, to hear from our great speakers. So, um, Pamela, can I ask you to, to start by introducing yourself? Um, Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Pam Akuli, and I'm the creator and founder of Just Like Me Books. So Just Like Me Books are the UK's first interactive and inclusive picture books that uses augmented reality technology to bring our stories to life. So with Just Like Me, we are super passionate about diversity and representation. And the business um, was founded and created based on personal experiences. So I'm a mother to three boys of mixed heritage. And in 2017, my eldest son was diagnosed with autism and was nonverbal. And we're just trying to find ways that he would get more engagement out of a book. And he was such a whiz with technology that we thought, what about if we kind of fuse the real worlds and the virtual worlds together and create an app where you have the book, you download the app onto your smart smartphone or tablet, and using the book and the tablet together, you'll be able to interact with the story, have 3D um, gamification in there and full interactivity with the book so we're on a mission basically to make education extraordinary and um, inclusive and interactive and not only do we create our own books but we also convert other people's books into AR experiences as well. Well, I'm uh, Ronan Hines, uh, this is Ravi Ranjan and we're the founders of Voilo, so it's an app for local business and charities that enables them to take payments directly from their phone and increase their traction. So essentially we're on a mission that fundamentally we're finding that too many of our favourite local business charities are struggling to survive, not because they don't have amazing offerings, but simply because they don't have access to the affordable technology to compete. So we create an app that directly enables anyone to download, take payment from their phone, and then have value add. So for the charity market, it's gift aid, and for, for the business side, it's about loyalty and engaging with their customers. 
and I think recently we're going to launch our consumer app, which is all about if anyone is doing a transactions, they get rewarded. So in short, we're trying to uh, merge the transactional experience with the rewarding experience together. Hi, I'm the CEO and founder of Make Me Fit Club. We're a well-being app, so we're not a fitness app. The difference between us and other apps out there is we integrate nutritional, mental, and physical health all on one platform. Our app is the first all-life well-being app. That means we've got no pre-programmed content. And we think of us as the Airbnb of well-being. So we connect real professionals in the UK, so think your personal trainers, your nutritionists, your counsellors, with members that want to get fit and stay healthy, so they can grow their business on our app while helping our members create long-lasting lifestyle changes in fitness, nutrition and mental health. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so maybe we could start by, um, if you could tell us a little bit about the motivation for starting your business. I think, Pamela, you touched on it a little bit with your yeah. son. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so um, as a mother, black mother to three boys who are mixed heritage and one with additional needs, it was became really apparent that in terms of like the, the books in the publishing world, it was very linear in terms of the lack of representation. Um, and when we're talking about representation and diversity and inclusiveness, we're not just talking about, you know, skin color, skin color, we're talking about ability as well. And we started to research that, this, and the statistics showed that in 2017, that there was literally like 0.5% of children's books that had a protagonist from an underrepresented background. And to have an underrepresented protagonist and have a disability as well, there was nothing out there at all. Um, with Just Like Me, we've got this kind of motto, which is create the things that you wish had existed. And I remember being a young black girl and not finding any representation. And I thought, I don't want the same for my children and future generations as well. So that was a key driving force for us. It was literally create the things that you wish existed. And we wanted to take it next level as well. So not just have the protagonist from an underrepresented community, but also to make sure that people of different abilities can still have that immersive experience when it comes to storytelling that was super powerful for us. I think for us, the main motivation was after working in this industry for around five, six years, and my pre previous startup back in India, I was also in a hyper-local market. So when I came UK to pursue my MBA, I did more research in the uh, small businesses, then got a chance to work with the Arriva trains to build their customer loyalty. Then I found there's a big gap between the big corporates when they use all the data to, in, to optimize and increase their business. And the small businesses, they have amazing offering, but they don't, don't have tool to do that. And that's how we started. And then we, I mean, Ronan joined the team early. And then we, and Ronan personally, like he worked for the charities and a small business. And, and he, he by himself seen the challenges there. And that was, that's how, that was the main motivation for us. So the main motivation for me was looking at health in the UK and the long-term illness burden, especially for those illnesses that can be prevented, and looking at what was actually being done for that. And there was not much out there, and it's more about symptom management at the moment with drugs, and we sit just before that, so we're, we're aiming to tackle reduce and prevent long-term illnesses so through lifestyle changes and it became apparent to me so I've worked in clinical trials I've been a personal trainer and there's a huge gap between actually integrating physical so your fitness is always isolated your therapy is always isolated and your nutrition is always isolated so actually bringing them together and actually getting experts to co-create programs for members to actually get to the root cause of their illnesses is, for me, the future of health in the UK. Okay, thank you. And um, can you talk a little bit about at what point you knew you had something that was worth pursuing and also perhaps a little bit about what set you apart from your, com your competitors? Um, there's this story that whenever I say it, I always get quite a little bit choked up, but 
basically our son Walter, because he was nonverbal, he had to find other ways of trying to communicate his needs to us. And he's always had like this love affair with books. He would literally go and pick a book off the bookshelf. And for example, if that page had a character of a little boy or girl having a drink, he would go to that same page every single time and bring us a page and point to it all the time. So he's basically telling us, I want a drink. So me and my husband soon realized that this was an amazing way that he was trying to communicate with us. Um, so when we first produced our first book, the protagonist looked like my son, so he could obviously identify and see himself, which is really, really powerful. But he still wasn't kind of getting that engagement from a book because he didn't understand the words. And I remember saying to my husband, Alex, I just really wish he would get the same level of engagement that he does with his tablet because he's an absolute whiz with technology. And it was kind of like that light bulb moment then. I thought, OK, VR world is kind of like happening, but what about the AR world? And although that's very prominent in the gaming industry, it's not so much when it comes to literature and books. So that was very much that kind of like aha moment. If we create an app where you still need, you know, the, the hard copy of the book, but it just allows that person to have that more immersive experience and it also helps with their communication as well. I think for us was like the initial primary research before the starting the product, before starting the business and the few data which was available on the internet, if we see the payment side itself, the big players like Square, Sum Up and all, they take around two to three percent cut on all the transactions. But for the small business, that's a massive amount. And when we when we're doing the research, we had a chance to talk with a few small businesses. If I take one example, like Aunt Sally next to our Aston itself, and you're talking to her and the the owner of that, and they mentioned like, if you help me to put my store with ten percent of the Aston student, I'm happy to pay three times off your product. What you're asking? So we're talking about more businesses and doing the secondary research, and also being a part of all the journey with the a VC like a polo program and all. That the entire journey help us to build that a core foundation of the business before launching and doing that research. And I think just to add to that, from there, <laughs> had the idea, knew where there was the, the opportunity there. I think there's an element when we first came together and we decided it was called Voilo and we were like, okay, it's a business, let's do it. That was a good thing. There was a time when we stood in front of, I'm sure we'll get into it, the first pitch and the investor said, don't speak to anyone else. We uh, we want to invest in you, but I think the fundamental time where, at least my light bulb moment, but I think it was, we were, we'd just released the app the day before, just testing it, and we were at a gig watching a band perform, and, at that, and they were selling merch, but only taking cash. So the half time, went and spoke to the band leader, said, look, sign up to this, took him two, less than five minutes, right there and then, and they took payments from their phone that night and doubled their expected profits, and it was like the most, immediate like oh wow this works like this this actually could make a difference if someone able to use it that quickly and probably our quickest success story and literally it was our first customer five minutes but it showed actually we had something and i think since then it's been all the other customer successes but that was probably that first moment i think for me um it was a personal experience well a couple of things actually personally mm -hmm. i've always been very good at f with fitness um but as i've I went through a couple of experiences in my life which made me closed off as an individual which helped, which then made me go and explore counselling and therapy services and it was only then when I actually saw that work, having the two together really changed my life in the sense that I wasn't using fitness, um, I was really good at fitness but my mental barriers were not being addressed. And then when, when they were started to be addressed, um, my fitness started to improve. I started to feel healthier in myself. Um, and you don't realize the stress that can cause on your body. Um, and then the second thing is working in clinical trials. The best research that's come out of Birmingham is actually prevention and stripping back drugs and um, the integration of more app trials. Um, as well as in 2018 there was a big push on integrating physical and mental health but not really having the infrastructure to actually implement it in primary care. So those three kind of mini light bulb moments led to this big aha moment where I actually f bridged that gap. 
Before we move on, we will obviously talk about the app and how you developed it, but just a little bit about your target customers, um, how you'd identified them early on, and also how um, you, know, you started to get them on board. <coughs> Um, f so for us, it was quite easy to kind of differentiate our customer base because obviously it was coming from personal experiences. So we kind of started from the very beginning. So when a child is, you know, from six months old, already they're starting to notice about colour and differences, and that's really super important. So we're thinking about, okay, the next stage when they're in kindergarten or nursery and, and the type of box that those education establishments are going to need and want and then it's like primary school um, and in primary school and secondary school the great thing is is that most of the schools have got access to a tablet of some form as well and it's one thing that made us quite laugh because we did quite a lot of research with schools both specialist school and mainstream schools and one of the comments that we got with secondary schools was that teachers were saying to us that they were constantly telling their students put your phone away because they're on social media and they're scrolling and things like that so we were just like, okay, teenagers don't like to listen. We've all been teenagers once, yeah, and we don't like to listen. So how about we flip that on its head and, and we offer them something which makes them have to take their phone out. So for example, we are doing projects with schools who are creating, you know, geography books, science books. So imagine that you've got a book and you've got the human body, yeah, you get your phone out and then the human body becomes 3D and you can strip away the layers of the skin, you can, you know, turn it around so you can see the full interactivity of the human body. So imagine in a classroom environment when the teacher goes, right, everybody get your phones out, you're going to need them. Like everyone's going to be like, yeah, I'm going to get my phone out and it gives them that incentive to learn and also bridges that gap. Um, where you know you may have a child or a student who has got additional needs or you know learning difficulties and it could be undiagnosed as well but they may be able to really fully digest that information in a more digital context so for us we were trying to flip that narrative of how you know technology can be seen as being a bit of a, a bad thing or you know lack of um, connection with us we're all about creating that connection um, through good <laughs> I think for us, we started with the small micro SMEs, and the way it started is so majorly from the research. But the target audience get much more identified during the executions when we're starting onboarding the more businesses, when we start conversation with the, all the potential customers, and this is where the another sector, which is charities, because when we are having our value propositions and we were starting selling it then charity saw we got a huge adoption and interest from the charity side because for them it's quite hard to have multiple card machines to accept the donations so they want some uh, portable stuff for their volunteer to raise the money and then we identify more problem for them and we start building more solution for for, for them i'm not sure you're gonna add anything well i was just gonna add i guess that where like kath mentioned the testing workshop in my opinion that is the most important workshop that will exist in this entire program because the one thing that we've learned probably through failure at times as well is not testing enough and not just going out, as Ravi said, walk to Aunt Sally, walk to all the, the shops there and just be like, would you buy this? Because if they're going to say no, it's brilliant, that's the best thing you can hear because then you're like, okay, I need to work on it. But without that, you can make up in your mind lots of excuses, lots of ideas. So I guess that would be the one thing that I'd say is that it is just literally testing it and seeing what are the reactions from people. Mum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no. She's going to say she loves it, whatever. You do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for me, it was the testing phase, definitely, because I had all these weird and wonderful ideas, and I just want to keep adding more, adding more, adding more, as the cost was going higher and higher and higher. And then I actually just had to stop, sit back, and just see, actually, what am I doing? Let me go out. Let me see. The people that's going to use my app, the professionals, the members, how are we actually helping them? And we stripped it back and we made a streamlined app that was user friendly, that they could engage with, that we can create a community because that's what we want to create on the app. But the testing is so important because we tested we, with um, professionals like graduates like nutritionists and um, therapists and then we tested with personal trainers and they had a completely different feedback for us because personal trainers is obviously very physical the way that you want to be um, 
be actually looking at the trainer delivering the session as opposed to a counsellor who will be sitting down. So having that feedback was so important. And then from, from the member side of things, it was more so, well, how easy is this to navigate? How, how do I... Um, how do I go from class to sessions? How do I integrate with the community? So we actually then implemented a community section where they can set up their own group calls so they can really create an ecosystem of support in each of their cities and then a wider one across the UK. Thank you. Um, and just lastly on this kind of section really is, um, could you just talk a little bit about your business model? So our business model is really heavily based on around the publishing industry, authors. So for us, it was really super important that we wanted to make sure that people keep going back to books time and time again. But also, when you read a story, you read it once and you like the story, but do you go back to it again? Not that often. So for us, we wanted to make sure that we created an app where, for example, we can add future additions to the app. So the book never changes, but say for every six months, we might add something to page 26 on a certain page. So it encourages that person to then go back to that book because it's the same story, but they've got something different in there. So that was super important for us. But the model itself is very heavily based on publishers and it's changed quite a lot. And I think we'll talk about that when we, when we talk about the actual app. But for, for us, we're just very much um, customer focused in, in terms of you know business to business, publishers and independent authors who have got a story to tell and they want to show it in a more innovative and creative way. Um, so the, the, like the two main, but like the business model for us, it's sort of b 2 b to c which is perfectly confusing. It's like everyone, um, but um, fundamentally is that we make it with, with, with each payment, we take a small, small percentage as one revenue stream and then also with our value add so whether it be the gift aid for the charities or the loyalty system for the businesses they pay a monthly cost for that but i think one thing and i'm sure we're all going to touch on it is the idea is what we sold to investors and what we said is that this is what we believe the business model is this is where we think that if we increase that if we work with the universities we do x y and z we will achieve this but the true reality of it is that business model can change we just had a meeting earlier today talking about a different change to the model so i think that's just one thing to always remember that investors or anyone wants to make money you don't start a business so i think without one to, no understanding that there has to be a money aspect but sometimes it's about moving in the right direction to find that specific business model that works um, for us, we're B2B, B2C, um, B2B to C. So we just added an extra degree of complexity, really. Um, but one of the things that we're very, um, very transparent about is we are a recurring subscription model for whether you're a professional or whether you're a member. So think of it as like you sign up to the gym and you take a monthly subscription but if then you want a personal trainer you pay at the personal trainers rate and that's very much implemented the same on our app um, and again you need to know about your business model your revenue streams especially when you're going for investment so subscriptions are always um, attractive to investors because it's recurring revenue and that's one thing that we took into account because down the line we will be um, seeking investment and now just moving on a little bit more about the app itself. So just first of all, to kick us off, um, did, was it always going to be an app for you or did you look at other, other ways of delivering your service? Um, for us, it was always first just going to be books. So it was just a case of writing books to kind of like diversify the publishing industry. And then it was only when we started to realise that how can we get children or you know teenagers to get more engagement from their books and also it was when we started it was kind of like the high of just before the murder of george floyd the rise of like black lives matter and um, so when we first funnily enough pitched to publishers our books they were very much like it's too niche you know there's not a market for it because our books were all about championing diversity and inclusiveness and then obviously we had you know 
Black Lives Matter, George Floyd and the rest of it. And then we suddenly started to see that publishers were just like, oh, we need more diverse voices. So we were very much in the kind of camp of we've always needed more diverse voices. But when we're talking about diversity and inclusiveness, we need to make sure that we are also, you know, including those who, you know, have got learning disabilities or different type of disabilities. Um, you always hear that kind of saying that like tech is for everybody and it should be. But at the moment, it's not representing everybody. And for us, that was like a really big, important factor for us. So it started off as just being books. But then we soon realized we're going to have to write a lot of books to make a, a bit of money because <laughs> you don't get a lot of money from writing books. So then we had the integration of the app and that literally took it to a whole new level. People were saying, oh, could you do our book as an AR book? Or, you know, could you do our comics? Or, you know, I'm um, even photography and things like that. We can make it into an AR immersive experience. So it kind of just grew the more we started to realize that, you know, if we are a tech company who are kind of flying that flag for diversity, inclusiveness, then we need to make sure that we are walking the talk and the app kind of bridges that gap and it, and it allows everybody to, you know, feel the benefits of the tech that we are using. I think for us, looking at our target market, small businesses, it's quite hard for them to carry the system everywhere. So we want to make a system which is quite easy to get to anyone and if you see the number itself mobile app is something that everyone is carrying is it's everywhere and that's why we want to make a system which is quite easy to use anyone as Ron mentioned over the previous story anyone can start using the taking the payment from anywhere around the globe so that's our main mission so that's why from starting it was like mobile app I think we're very similar so we want to make it as accessible as possible so whether you're training somebody in the gym or you're doing a counseling session from home or you're logging on to a class at a cafe we wanted to make it as accessible as possible and um, yes yeah, so. so now maybe you could Aisha, talk a little bit about um, how you've gone about building the app Um, so with our app, we actually started off with a, a different um, tech company and um, that was to produce our first book and that went really, really well. But as we started to realise that we wanted to do more and more and more with the book and the tech is constantly changing, um, we were trying to find you know, other tech developers who were very much in line with our ethics and morals when it comes to diversity in the tech scene and using tech for good. So we did a lot of research. We started to look overseas first of all and then we started to, we, we made the decision that we wanted to use UK developers and if we're all honestly with you, it's a lot of networking, it's a lot of phone calls, it's a lot of asking people for favours. Do you know someone who does X, Y and Z? And that in itself can be ridiculously time consuming but for us we wanted to use a developer who really understood what our vision and what our mission was and sometimes that takes a bit, bit of time to find the right person. Thankfully we have at the moment so we're now we've um, one company which is really great um, but in terms of like sourcing that out we've it's, it's a lot of trial and error I'll be honest with you you might find the perfect person first time and it might take you like 20 30 times to find that right person um, and as we grow we may need to find different people and you know hire more people so it's just constantly changing for us I think for us we started with majorly with the prototype just the design because that helped us in terms of understanding how it looked like and in terms of design also we made a full fledged design how the app will look like in coming one year or coming two years then we break down the entire design in a quarterly basis we want to very much agile let's build the first thing small features a, a value add thing and then we learn from the customer and as we will use the feedback loop to develop furthermore so that's how we started the entire so first thing is entire design and then we developed the mvp we tested with a few customers and then we started adding new more features and eventually it helped us and for our entire dev team back in India that's a benefit of I mean also sing back in India because India having a good technical team and the dev cost is too low so for us we want to keep the cost low and having the, a good quality so we also was back in India and now I think we have the team around six for the business app and we want to onboard more for the consumer app so yeah <laughs> Um, for me, so I was very naive coming from a science health background. 
I went on the website, went on to Clutch, started looking at app developers, looking at the reviews, the ratings, had uh, about 10 different calls with different developer, different companies, um, and then stuck on one. Um, but they were way too high, the costs were extremely high. They suggested that we strip down what we want and um, they also said that we can't take your work on right now, we're really inundated, but this company is based in London um, and they, they've they done similar, well, fitness apps before, but there's a guy there that will, I think you'll connect with very well. And he was completely right because he completely understood my vision. He understood what I wanted to achieve. He understood that it wasn't a fitness app. It was a well-being app. It was about increasing the business for professionals while helping our members. Um, and through that, we sat, done the design, um, right through to pilot testing, internal testing, pilot testing, um, testing that MVP with um, different groups of people. Um, and I think that you can go and test and trial out, but for me personally, we're bringing the app development in-house now because as we're starting to grow, um, we we want somebody there readily available um, under the umbrella of Make Me Fit Club so we have greater control on the timings that changes are happening um, and we can not only preempt things a lot better but we can react to things that um, might go wrong or we need to resolve. Well, I guess like just to add by hearing both of these stories as well from what I've heard like it's not easy. I'd say it's one of the hardest bit that exists as the dev team. If you're sitting here and you are a dev, you work in computer science, well, I think brilliant. But it's 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 not as simple as like, we both did computer science, but it doesn't mean I think we could have coded our app necessarily. But it did help, I'd say. But I think the real balance is networking, finding the right person. How you you just said Dallas, so or how you met is like those opportunities come. I've just met someone else who wants to look to be a CTO, the exact same thing, but and you can try services, but services can be hit and miss. So I think, unfortunately, it is sometimes about just go, trying stuff and fail. maybe if you can give them a small, a, agree to a smaller project, whether that be someone just to just to test things out. Because yeah, a little exactly a sprint. Because I think things sometimes it just might not work. It might not be the right situation. But we've managed to make outsourcing work quite well. And it works, it sounds like it. we've all now found it, but it wasn't, none of us found it first time easily. So I think that's just the one, it's possibly the best thing to prioritize of trying to find the right people, trying to build the right network. Whether it just be students as well around Aston directly. Yeah, it's interesting you said you both came from computer science backgrounds, but even, even with that background, it's still a very steep learning curve. So if you haven't got any sort of technical background at all, it must be really I, I think I guess like I don't want to speak for Ivy in the sense, but I think one one thing that agreed really did help is where where we have outsourced to India what one thing that at least from my reflection from my side of the business, well, I'm only do the operations and Ravi covers the technical side, but is that it sometimes you have to be very specific about how you instruct what you say and I think the computer science background did help in when Ravi's putting together a document He's thought of every single thing, and that's so that's the ba balance you have to play. Where you've got someone in house, they'll understand the nuances, they'll understand the business context a lot more. So it's how you balance that, I think. And also trust your gut. I can't um, emphasize that enough. Like when your gut says this is the guy to go with, or this is the company to go with. Opposite, if it's saying no, you've got reservations. Cut your losses, run, and move on to the next. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, how, do you um, how do you go about sort of measuring the success um, of the app? I, I mean, do you have particular metrics that you're, you're looking at? Probably different for all of you, I would imagine. Uh, yes, so with us, it's obviously things like we can analyze the amount of downloads the app has as well. And also, it's really important for us to see how many people are have uninstalled it as well, because that's um, a really good way of like 
given us that data and insight and given us that perspective thinking like maybe we need to change things or what's not working because it's great when things are working and your ego takes a little bit of a shine but I think it's more important to recognize when things aren't working and act quickly um, and for us we've We've, we've gone through so many trials and tribulations to get the app to where we are all so excited and energized by it and we see the results that it's given us as well because for us we realized early on that nobody else in the UK was doing what we were doing and then we had to question why is nobody else in UK and Europe doing what we're doing and then we started to you know AR has been around for a long time and like I said but more in the gaming industry um, and the books that have got AR, there's nothing wrong with them, but they don't add anything to it, yeah? And we didn't want ours to be like a gimmick. It had to have the educational purpose. So for us, we spent a lot of time making sure that the app is right. Um, so, you know, things, feedback, customer feedback is a great one. We had the most amazing customer feedback um, when we first launched it um, from a mother who's got a child who has got special needs. And she said, my child loves the book, but he gets to page 18 and he literally throws the book down and starts screaming. And we were just like, but why? And she goes, I think it's something to do with the noise on that page. It's a it's a drumming scene for a kid's book. So there's a lot of interactivity and a lot of noise, and a lot of flashy lights. She goes, but he gets to that page and then he literally just has a meltdown. And I'm like, OK, that's really interesting. And then we started to ask more of our customers, what do you think about page 18? And people were saying, oh, I love it. And other people was, were saying, well, my child just closes a book or he, does, he gets to that page and then he doesn't want to go any further. And then we soon realized it was like the sensory overload for a lot of children with disabilities. So the way that we could kind of caveat that was just, just add a mute button. And it's something as simple as that. And we didn't even think about it initially. But now that child or that individual has got full control of that story. So he gets to that page and he mutes it. And then he turns the next page and it unmutes it. So it's things like that. That's a huge kind of like metric of success for us. Um, but obviously the downloads and, and seeing how many people un uninstall it is a huge one as well. I guess I'll speak to the sort of, I think it's pretty similar in the sense of, for me, in my bit, there's, I guess like, from my side, it's customer feedback. It's the response where it is, from a fundamental point, it's active users, it's sales, it's revenue. That at the end of the day, as I say, this is a business we have got investments that they're looking at. But I think then there are the when it goes to the app specific metrics we look at, so churn rate, um, how many installs, downloads. I think I'll let Ravi speak to more specifics there. But it's about having. It's always just important to be able to have a look at that overview of all the of all the metrics. Are they all going in the right way? And that's fundamentally the biggest thing you're looking for. And I think in terms of the app, if I put like, if app could be a perfect app, I would say no, because every time there will be an optimization. And starting from the time the customer is installing the app, what's the size of the app, how much time is taking to install the app, then in terms of registration, how much time is taking to register. So how we optimize to reduce the time in terms of the uh, engagement, I also yeah, another KPI is engagement how much is the user engaging with the app. So there's multiple KPIs in terms of optimizing the app, and that's eventually identify or put, like, is the app is successful or not. Definitely, churn rate is a major factor, and that's why we have to analyze the entire funnel of a customer journey from the time they install and the time they're not using it. So what are those churn rate? Where is the fall? What was the hole? And identifying that and then working on that is very much important. Um, for us, again, it's the metrics with respect to downloads um, through to s subscriptions. Um, but specifically to Make Me Fit Club, we have the community section on the app where anybody can set up group calls. And we actually set up group calls every Thursday evening where we get our community to ask us questions um, how they about the app, about us. Um, with our professionals and they actually feed back to us through that um, through our community and tell us about ways that we can improve tell us about ways that they're loving the app tell us about ways that they're engaging um, and we also have a rating system on each of our professionals so we can tell if an expert falls below three stars then they're put on a probationary period until they can get back up to four stars so they have to be at four out of five stars um, and if they drop below that for two months or more, 
we actually then will remove them from the app so we remain we keep that quality um there and i think you've covered quite a bit of this actually i think um i was going to ask you how you kind of keep, keep make your app stick you keep people using it and coming back but presumably it's sort of just looking at the data looking at the feedback and making any changes yeah pretty much i mean quite recently what we've started to do we have like click through marketing with our app as well so you get to the end of the book and then it says did you enjoy this book if you did click here to see other books which have got an AR experience so that encourages the the user and the reader to go and seek out you know similar books of you know AR immersive experiences and for us that's really important because we don't want it to just be like a one-off kind of here's a book here's an AR and then like you never use it again we want to show people just how much the world is changing in terms of education and literature um, and there's so many different books out there that have got that AR immersive experience that we're creating now so that's really important for us Brilliant. and now um, I think Rowan you, you touched on this e earlier just look, look a little bit how you funded the business obviously I think probably all of you have done it slightly differently um, so yeah so we initially um, when we had it I think um, one thing I guess to touch on this is that we, we had the business idea Ravi brilliant Got, had the business plan we were there but it was then okay actually we the thing is with apps they're not cheap uh, <laughs> and that you're gonna burn money so you realize actually we needed funding um, we we were just like, recognized that we could bootstrap it for longer fund it all ourselves but like this was a, a race we wanted to where we wanted to capture the market so we went for um, investment. So one thing I was to shout out straight away is think, as I think we spoke about on the panel quite a lot, is how important networking is. It sounds it's a buzzword, but actually it's how Ravi met one of our investors at the time, and we went on from there. So then it ended up in August of last year. We did a pitch and we secured our pre-seed of funding of 125,000. So what that allowed us to do was um, build that MVP. Um, I guess just cut to like the next bit is that sort of that was all that sort of initial MVP stage we then set recognize we're now product market fit we have an app it's worked we've I've told you the story we've done these had a few examples charge start using it but now how do we scale it so now we've just went for a second round of funding we considered venture capitalists in the end closed off with angels and closed 400,000 but the idea of that money is again it's about taking a great foundation and now how do you make it into a business how do you start hitting revenue how do you get a product market fit and i think at every stage of investors what you're selling to them is not this is my app and what this is what it does but you're selling the vision you're selling what specifically what problem are we solving i think earlier you asked about that stickiness question it's are you still solving the problem that will can make it sticky if you if you are solving the problem people will want to keep using you but and that's what investors are looking at so i think we have given away equity for the business but for us, it's about that it allows us to reach that goal we have a lot faster. I think I just want to add before, like before our angel round of investment also, there are lots of support from the organization in the West Midland through the grants. So there are lots of grants which are available which help us to build that initial MVP and a product. I mean, there are a few bursaries from the Aston University itself that initially give that boost and then support in terms of either developing the business or that. So that was a very started and crucial, I mean, the initial amount, and then we go for the angel and then for the next rounds. Um, so with Make Me Fit Club, we, well, I self-funded, I took a massive risk, um, self-funded, bootstrapped, um, and then I took out, with British Business Bank, they've got startup loans which are very good interest rate. Um, they're dedicated at people like you, um, like us, that have an idea that actually can make a change. And what they also do is they help you create that initial business plan, um, initial business plan, initial marketing plan, what kind of um, business you're creating. Um, and that gave me the initial kind of knowledge of this is actually what funders are looking for. So in a year's time, in two years' time, these are the kinds of things that I need to keep in my mind and keep developing that business plan going forward. Um, to the point now where we've pitched to a couple of investors last week, um, we're pitching to another one next week, and it's about taking that journey 
but finding the right fit that's for you, whether it's self-funded, whether it's um, a startup loan, whether it's grants, um, and then moving on to crowdfunding, angel, venture, and understanding the difference between the three. Understanding, they're not just giving you the cash, are they? It's the support, the mentoring, yeah. and particularly with VCs, they're going to be with you for life, really, so you need to make sure that it's a really good fit. Yeah, quite similar. I mean, with us, we had um, three children at the time, six and under, so uh, life was already really busy. And uh, we realised that we didn't have, you know, a surplus of money to kind of go straight in there. So we were still working our full-time jobs whilst doing this. And this is quite common for a lot of startups. I think you know, you have this idea you have, and you think it's a great idea, and it, and it probably is, but then you also think that you will pitch it and get investment straight away. Um, and with us, they ripped our pitch deck to shreds, first of all, because we were just not investor ready at all. The business plan wasn't there. The business model wasn't there. Um, and you have to kind of take that knock, and sometimes it's the best thing because it makes you think, well, do I actually want investors at this stage? And it makes you go and seek alternative routes. And for us, it was a lot of um, grants and funding, working with Innovate UK Edge was a great one as well. Um, going on accelerator programs were brilliant as well for me. So going on founders or women in tech, for example, and things like that. And going on these 12-week accelerator programs where they will literally go through the business side and the emotional side of it as well, which I think a lot of people don't really take into consideration how much of an impact this is going to have on you, on your partner or your family or just you in general. It's so much. It's so all consuming at times because you it's that's your baby and you want it to succeed but there's also the other side of it it's the downtime are you having enough rest are you doing the basic things like eating and sleeping which we kind of neglect because we're so focused on getting our business to where we want it to be um so for us it was now we are investment ready um but we went down like the funding there's loads of grants out there it, again it just has to take the time to seek out the ones which are applicable to you and definitely go on accelerator programs there are so many out there and they'll just make a huge difference Yeah, well, I think first the, the most the most important one uh, for us was be seen with Carolyn. I think Ravi, I'll let Ravi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but actually, the um, when it comes to the um, those invest those accelerators is like I think what you put in, what you get out, and absolutely as as we started, I think we went for one in Bruntwood. We we've been on quite a few actually. We've done it. We've done our fair share, and I think each one has different benefits, different um, value adds, and it's about what you can take. I think NatWest, which I'm sure Delby we can talk to, the, the face of NatWest Accelerator now, in my opinion, is um, sort of is brilliant because it gives you so much exposure. It's there. Then all the way to where we went to ones, I said like BC and E4F was great when we first started, which is the ones that I'm sure everyone here would be more more looking at too. And then as you grow, they they scale up. With us, we've been on one with Barclays that helped us at that next stage. So. Taking the free support, I guess, is, is the lesson uh, here. Like, where, where can you get free support? And the accelerators, they get paid the more the, the more people they get. Essentially, more people are interested a lot of the time. So, absolutely take advantage of that. And it's just growing your network all the time, isn't it? Yeah, and absolutely. And, and don't be afraid, also. I think when you are a startup, you you, seem to, you start to realise all the things that you can't do or you didn't think about and that can be quite daunting but also it's that time to think about what your strengths are. So for example, my husband is has been in the graphic design industry for 15 years so we literally were just like, does anybody want a logo for free? And I'll do your logo for free if you can give me some advice on X, Y and Z. So take the time to think about what are your strengths and what can you offer to someone else because everyone's going to need something at some point in your life so that's really important to just kind of like um, hustle a little bit. <laughs> Great question. Okay, so what something that we learn is that you know you can get very excited about your project or your idea and when you're speaking to people
be selective with how much information you give and also think about it in terms of IP or patenting it which is something that we've just got gone through at the moment so it's make sure that you don't give away <coughs> too much sensitive information because there's people out there who will want to support you but let's be honest there's people out there who want to pinch your idea as well so if you've got something take the time to you know get advice about IP intellectual property about getting it painted in trademarking all of that stuff it's really important the idea is great but the idea without that security is going to be someone else's idea quite soon so be selective with what information and also ask yourself when you're networking what do you want to get out of this conversation is it advice um, is it some freelance work is it collaboration be really kind of be transparent with what you want to achieve but also hold back on anything that's quite sensitive I would say I think initially as a very initial stage yes, there's a risk but that's why it's very much as adding to her point it's very much important what we want to convey to the other persons but also we as an entrepreneur everyone knows where we want to be and it's our head as I mean idea is one person 99% execution it's more about executing it in the right way right time so someone can listen that your idea but are they able to execute the way you want to be is very much important yeah a million percent agree with everything that these guys have said but also when with having the right paperwork in place when you are on accelerator programs are you and you are networking across Birmingham or other cities it's crucial that you to get the right advice to get the right connections you need to be able to explain your business because if you don't you might then be partnering with people and then a few weeks down the line or a couple of months down the line they haven't been able to help you because what they envisioned your business to be wasn't correct so it's about having understanding having that paperwork in place but then having being able to explain your business when you are on these accelerators because that group acceleration, the community events are very much geared around helping you better your business and grow your business. Um, and the other thing that accelerator programs do, they put you in touch with mentors, people that have done it before, people that are successful and also other programs like the Founders Collective where it runs through funding right from the start right to the end and actually has guest speakers, venture capitalists, um, crowdfunding experts come in the morning, every Tuesday morning, 8 a.m. to explain what they're looking for. So it gives you an insider knowledge to stuff that you might not have been um, privy to before. Brilliant, thank you. Good question. Um, just quickly looking at marketing, could you um for marketing with us we started off with like the very basics so going into schools because we wanted to get the honest feedback from teachers and you don't get anything more honest than children so <laughs> we wanted to know what they thought about it <laughs> not just the book the technology so for us when we're talking about and we're thinking about our consumer we're thinking about the children and we're thinking about the parents, we're thinking about the teachers, right up into the grandparents who often are sitting down with their grandchildren and reading the story. Now, that grandparent who may be a little bit scared of technology, we want to make sure that the app is really slick and really easy and there's no questions about it. They can literally go to the app store, they can type in the title of the book, click OK, download it, free, it's done. It literally takes them like 10 seconds to do. So for us, that was really super important. We didn't want to have any barriers when it came to technology. So schools, working with schools, having that schools become our champions for just like me. So if they've got a certain thing that they really want to work on, whether it's diversity, whether it's um, gender stereotyping, e equality and things like that, finding a school that are really going to champion us and the academies as well, not just the schools, it's the academies who are buying the books for thousands of schools across the UK that was really important for us as well um, and then we were quite lucky in certain aspects we had um, British actor Will Poulter who's now one of our um, ambassadors for Just Like Me and that literally came on the back of an article that I wrote and he retweeted it and then I slid into his DMs and said thank you 
and then he was like you're welcome and I went do you want to read my book and he was like yeah sure and it was it sounds like really simple but it, it was and I mean I've tried that with loads of other influencers and actors and I got nothing so yes maybe I got lucky I don't know whether there was opportunity um, and preparation to go that I don't know but from doing that and writing the article um, about something that I'm really super passionate about which is like you know neurodiversity women in tech and things like that and um, he so just happened to come and be an ambassador and read our stories um, and now we're working with him on future projects as well which has been great um, but yeah basically we started off with schools and t to be honest with you schools will always be our like target market because they're the people that we're trying to influence so it's really important that we listen to them and take on their feedback and work with them almost like a partnership um i think without doubt marketing is often i think it's you can think it's one thing and you realize it's a whole load of other things that you've never even considered and i think there's a lot of lessons we're still learning um, while, while we're sort of giggling is that, that this morning we literally had the entire day spent on marketing and how, how we really try and accelerate it and I think some lessons we've learned which I guess is worth sharing is that it's not just posting on Facebook it's not just I'm not maybe that's we shouldn't be but as in fundamentally it's about right really thinking okay what is the goal of marketing what do you want it to do if it's just to get traction is get visibility I think it's looking at what are those priorities for the business and what can fuel that. Like organic social media, absolutely, this is the place. It's your it's your shop front needs to exist. But should you be spending ninety percent your time of it, or should you actually be looking at what are the where can you get PR? Where can you get again? Go back to that. Those free opportunities. We've just been in West Midlands Growth Company. Just done a, done a story on us. Brilliant. That's now gone out to so much large of an audience. Look at sort of how you build the brand. Sort of. I've seen like Pamela's now on like every panel that's going <laughs> since we met last week because it's building the brand, it's building the exposure and showing people exactly about the business. And I think for us, that's the key. It's like one, one of those things we're trying to achieve. The one thing we have is that what I'll say is just any business starting that's worked quite well for us is that awards are free to apply for. And you're essentially getting, if you're getting that, whoever runs it, it people look at that and they think, <laughs> wow, they must be all right if they're shortlisted. So I think, and this man I'm saying he should have a side business of writing award applications because he's so good at it. But um, but yeah, I think it's looking at those free opportunities and when you at, at the start and then building from that. And I think I guess the final point, point not to ramble on too much, is that the back to that um, perfection is the enemy of good. That fundamentally, it's about trying some trying out a marketing campaign, trying out something that is going to get you in front of the customers that you're trying to get in front of. And expecting it to fail, but expecting to learn where it fails, I think is the, is the big thing. And just the one thing I just want to add, there is still we are looking for crazy market here. So if you know anyone from your colleague network, please, please refer to us. <laughs> um, I second everything that these guys have said. So for us, um, not schools, but universities, so giving graduates an opportunity to have an alternative route to um, to be self-employed but on our app so increase their business rather than going down the traditional route so your well-being professionals, your therapists, your nutritionists um, and then also exploring market, well, ads because for us we have to do LinkedIn for professionals and Instagram but understanding what ads actually work actually putting something out there and seeing what you actually get back and tweaking it and constantly tweaking it because the market is always changing your customers what they expect they're so influenced by everything that's going on as well so just being up to date and being ahead of that curve is very important um, PR again very useful so partnering with universities um, Birmingham Chambers of Commerce other companies or other organizations like that that would do um, we, where you can write a um, where they can do PR on you where you can write an article with them and they can put it on their newsletters on their websites um, is really crucial to getting your name out there and again awards Brilliant. so I've got a couple more questions is there any questions in the room
Enjoy your first one. <laughs> Um, I think with us, one of the things that we soon realised, like I've touched on it previously, that there wasn't that many AR augmented reality books out there. And for us, we wanted to make sure that we were using augmented reality to have the immersive experience. Also, we wanted to make it accessible as well, because although the technology is great and it's very flexible, it can be very expensive. So if, for example, you've got an author who's written a book, are they going to want to spend £15,000 to get their book converted into an AR? Probably not. So what we then decided on the back of this is that how can we make AR more accessible? So we created almost like a, a secondary software platform system where um, authors and publishers can come to us and say, you know, I want this level of interactivity in the book. I want it to do this. I want this character to do this. And they can also like choose almost like a, from a catalogue of things that they want to do. And that takes the um, price back down for them which makes it a lot more accessible so no one else is really doing that it was very much like a bespoke here's the book here's the app and then there's no continuation with it with this we have that click through marketing like I said so they finished the book and then we're like okay that book was really cool I want another book like that let's see what else is on that library that I can choose from I think for us like when we are developing the applications I put all the features in, uh, there's a very famous framework called Cano model. So it's basically define all the features in three category. Must have features, good to be have, and the delight in features. So first we start building with the must have, and also looking at the competitors. What's the competitive advantage that we're gonna have from the other competitors? And are we definitely f are solving a problem for the customers? Then we start using the feedback loop and categorizing all the features and all the product things in these three uh, categories and start developing it. So that's how being in a competitive advantage also for understanding our own capabilities, like what we want to build, how much it's gonna cost, and how it's look like as per the value add for the customer. Kano. It's K-A-N-O. Um, for me, we looked at what was out there in terms of your fitness apps, your well-being apps, your mental health apps, and everything kind of pointed to being segregated. So we wanted to integrate nutrition, fitness, and mental health on one platform. That was one of our key unique selling points. Um, and then the second thing was every fitness app you'll see is has a program of some sort. We wanted to remove that to create a community, to create that support, to actually emphasize the five areas of well-being. And off the back of that, actually create that support system for our members that is very much needed now, but has always been needed. Um, and then the third thing was we don't employ professionals ourselves. We onboard professionals from all over the UK to run their businesses on our platform, and that isn't something that any fitness or wellbeing app has done. Thank you so much. Just uh, the last the final question. Um, how long can app development take to <coughs> learn? Just a brief idea. How much can it cost? And then what, uh, what was your main challenge in creating the app? Great question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no. Well, I guess that was going to be my response, and I'll let, I'll let Ravi uh, speak yeah. specific. <laughs> is that um, I think it's really, really hard to define, but I think, well, right, I'll, I'll, let, I'll pass to Ravi about specifics actually. But um, my only advice from my background there is that sort of starting off with the MVP, looking at what options is there no code, is there low code, is there something like Million Labs, that is there the Super Tech Serendip? I know I'm just giving names of things but all of these things are all fr again i'll go back to it that free support that access that will help you the mill mil um s the serendip program which exists they will help fund and code your first prototype and i think that's 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 the key 
to at least proving the model and then if you need to get investment I let Ravi sort of talk to the casts. We outsourced to India and it still wasn't cheap, so there's <laughs> there's a little bit. But I think that's a really good question, but it totally depends upon what exactly you want to build and how intense. Because you can invest a million pound also in terms of building the product entire one year. But it's more about it, what the core feature, the one thing that you want to build, and that's going to solve the problem for customer. So starting with that, it might take around one to two months. And as Ronan mentioned, using the third-party organizations, they're not going to cost more because it's more about building those platform which is no code. And once we, it's more about uh, trying that with the customers and we get the validation from the customers. Yes, it's solving this, it's solving problem customers. Then we can start investing more money on the building the product. Yeah. So, did you have anything? Yeah, yeah. My Not unless you're paying yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, so if your contract was to say that, it might be alluding to the fact that you can't be employed elsewhere. That might take into account self-employment, working, or um, having a business and you being paid from that business. But that's something that you'll have to speak with your employer. Um, however, as a startup, I don't. Well, I didn't pay myself for a very long time because this, of the financial constraints. So um, for me, it was about developing the app outside of my working hours. Um, and quite often that's 60, 70 hour weeks where you have to be resilient and you have to put in the time. But it's definitely worth it. And the second question was, um, what did you, I think that <laughs> what, what do we give up in terms of the percentage wise of the business? I mean, our initial round was uh, 125,000 pounds, and it was a mix of because very much important to have those investors on board who were aligned with our vision. So there was a cash, there were some services, like because they're running their marketing agencies and all. So it's a mixer of that, and so we given around, I would say, for the cash, we given some part of equity, and for also services, we given some part of equity on the basis of option pool. So option pool basically giving those shares for coming three, five years. So we structure in that way that we're getting the cash also, and for that we're giving right away the equity, and for whatever the service you're gonna get, you're giving the equity on the basis of whatever the service they provide. Thank you. And my final um, two questions. One, I <laughs> <laughs> I think the first thing I would say, I would really appreciate all of you that you took a step to being here because I totally understand when I was a student, after five is very hard to go to any other things and all. I really appreciate and thanks all of you taking that time and coming here. So you are taking an extra step for being whatever you want to achieve. Second thing in terms of uh, for the MVP, the first time we raised the investment, we didn't have the product also, we just had a design. And we went to like I went to a networking event. I was talking to uh, potential investors and people. I just shown the design. This is what I want to make, and this is how it's gonna look in the coming two three years. So I tried to tell the entire story, and I I wanted him to be part of that journey, and that's why he onboarded. And once we onboarded, I think in terms of developing that that entire design, it cost us from the India around three k, and to build that MVP. 
initially it costed us around 15 to 20k yes well, of course just to add to that that's 15 20k for that for what you what we class as that for like that launch date in november which i sort of mentioned so like, there's a, a lot more money going the more money going to it since that 125k of yeah. the whole investment it continued to cost more that because the thing is with apps is they are constantly you've got to constantly update them you've got to constantly fund them constantly innovate on them and It's a, it's a good question. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know how it was. It, I think, like, it was the general rule of split between tech, dev, marketing, and team. I mean, as for the industry average, it has been said, like, if we are a tech business, the major cost will be on tech because that's the value add. That's the USP. Mm-hmm. However, going down the line, the major expense will be on the marketing. So initially for coming, I mean, for initial two, three years, it will be entire dev because, and that's why tech industry work on the valuation rather than profitability. And they, that's why the entire VCs and these sectors, because they work on raising the money and money and building that product. But going further is more marketing. So if I put a percentage initially, I would say somewhere around between 40 to 60% will be on the dev cost and the rest of the thing. I think there's always the risk that someone is going to do what you're doing and I think the moment that you're kind of open and accepting of that then you can just continue on the line and the vision that you've implemented for yourself I'll give you an example so we got approached by you know the TV program Dragon's Den yeah so we got a approached by Dragon's Den and we went through the application process, we went um, through the interview and literally two weeks before we were about to go to Manchester to film, I and it goes back to that gut feeling, um, I woke up that morning and I went, we're not going to go and my family were going, oh my god, but it'd be an amazing opportunity, think of the exposure that you're going to get, but I just knew that we weren't ready at that point and if we were to go, Somebody sitting on the sofa that night would be like, oh, that's a great idea. We hadn't protected anything at that point. We didn't have a great business model. So it wasn't the right time. And for me, timing is crucial. I know that you you can see your vision, yeah? But you have to be really patient and take it step by step and also be flexible with your approach. What you think that you're going to achieve in day one, three months later, you can completely change that. Now, with us, we know that tomorrow... Amazon could turn around and say, we've got AR box out there. That's not a concern for us at all, because the reason that we created the AR, AR box is completely different to why Amazon are doing it. We've got a story to tell and the reason behind it, and that story is really powerful, and people buy in to the story. So why did you create the book? Oh, because I've got a child who's got autism. And then that person goes, oh, my nephew's got autistic, or I know someone's autistic, I'm going to buy the book for them. That's how you have the chain of reaction and that kind of marketing and storytelling and connection is so much more powerful than Amazon just going out and saying, we've got a Mickey Mouse book that now does AR. They can do that. So that's not a concern for us. And also, we're not competing against Amazon. That's not who we're thinking about. Yeah, We're thinking about diversifying the publishing industry and how these AR books and technology can help right from the offset from early years right into university. So if you guys are in your lectures, yeah, you've got your lecture book and you know, maybe geography book, for example, yeah, and you've got a picture of a volcano on there, yeah, and you can just get your phone out and then literally see the volcano come to life. Literally come to life, you can see the lava coming down the page using your smartphone or tablet. So for us, we thought about the whole journey from A all the way to, to, to to, I can't think of my alphabet. A to Z. Thank you. <laughs> A to Z. Yeah, it's getting like A to Z. So, yeah, I think the moment that you can say to yourself, yeah, you're always going to have competitors, but what you do, you're going to do it completely differently and take ownership and have confidence in that.
we are like, oh, I need to create this the, the idea, the product. And what if you go around like telling people, okay, <coughs> this is my idea because I, you want them to build the app. And you're telling them exactly the features that you want in the app. How do you know that they won't just take, build the app for you and then use it as their own, call it their own? I think that's a really interesting question. Just adding to his point more, like and her point. If Amazon, the big player, want to make anything, they can do it. But for them to build that, it's gonna cost more, and it's gonna take time. So they're looking for those early startups where they can acquire and they can rebuild and they can invest more. So it's a much more opportunity rather than threat. So that's the one thing. And I'm just adding to his point and to answering to your question in terms of the patent side. I mean, especially the tech side, it's quite hard to patent the code algorithm. It's very hard because anyone can just change the one line of the code and they can use it. It's, it's quite easy. But what extra layer that we can build around that? So let's see if we are starting building the app with the third party organization. All the contracts have been placed in a proper way that save us. We have the right. And if we can patent, uh, if you have the logo, so we can do the trademark of the logo. So it's more about all the legal aspects we can do as a, a agreement and the contracts that could save. I'm not sure if you want to well, add. I just want to add on the, your, your specific question with the dev side and how can you make sure, well, there's an NDA which you can get. So fundamentally, they'll, they, you can write a contract that says, we agree not to build your app. The, val the true law and value of that is one that's up for debate. Whether someone can, but it, what it does, it often gives, you, you can get a good instinct to how they react to that straight away. If they're like, no, 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 I don't want to sign it, well, that's a big red flag straight away. Yeah. Um, if they're too keen to sign it, that's another thing as well. <laughs> so it's sort of, you get, you get that good feeling, but I think that's the one thing. The end, we, we send out NDAs all the yeah. time because it's just easier, I think. You also have it written in your agreement that you own the code, that they can't develop an app that's written with this code. So it's about having that in place and having a lawyer where you can review those documents, can develop those documents for you, um, which there's a lot of like legal clinics and stuff associated with accelerator programs where you can get this advice as well. So especially, I know that lawyers, are well, wait, they're going to be so expensive, but accessing those um, through accelerators and stuff can be more, way more affordable. I guess fundamentally they're investing in you as in that they're taking that's but if it was guaranteed it wouldn't be an investment I don't think as in about you but what you value the business at in many ways and how what they agree to value the business at is based on the risk of failure I'd say how much they were willing to put in for that um I don't know if you want to add anything but I think one of the additional benefit of being into the UK eco startup ecosystem is the government have made few uh, steps to structure the entire investment in the way that it give extra benefit for the investors in terms of tax saving, which is SEIS, EIS, SEIS, which is seed investment. I'm not sure exactly. You <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> So that allow investors to save their tax, annual tax. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it is. Yeah. That's the most important thing because especially as a first time when you're first raising money, the SEIS will protect investors so much they can pretty much get about sixty percent or so by by the end all, all back if it was to go wrong. So and not every investor uh, most investors should know about it, but sometimes when it comes to angels or private investment <laughs> it's new to them, so sometimes it is just worth mentioning because the, it can make them more, yeah. One more question from the room, I think, and then there's, I think there's some on the um, Slido. Is there there? So if you've got still got time, to, like, still got time to write some questions on Slido as well, if you want to. Vigiana, you got another question? Um, so I'll, I'll be quite, would you guys be interested in some knowledge transfer? Or, um, and, and also some knowledge because we're going to start to
When you say you guys, you mean all of them? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm open to knowledge transfer. In terms of um, your markup, I don't actually sell products, so not really much that I can help you with with that. But if there's other things that you want to touch upon, yeah, definitely happy to do knowledge transfer. Time is money and always go with your expertise. Like I'm really great at operations, building a team, um, marketing as well, but coding, spending time doing that, learning all of that, that would take a hell of a long time and way more than what it's taken to develop. I guess you have to know yourself. I get bored very easily, so it's not for me. Yeah, just to touch on that, I would completely agree. I think when you are running your business, you, you've got so many different hats and so many things to juggle. I think what the world kind of needs is people like yourselves where you know what your strengths are. So play to your strengths. What the world doesn't need is Pamela, who's semi-good at coding. Like, that's not... They need people who are amazing at coding. But that's not to say that I don't have an interest in it. Funnily enough, my husband is actually learning a lot of the AR side. Um, that, that's by working you know, day in, day out with our developers. So he's naturally started to pick up on things and learn things. So that's great. But he's not going to sell himself as a developer. That's not, what he, that's not what he does. That's not what his strengths are. So, um, yeah. yeah. And as you're growing a team, you, you have to identify the skills within your team as well. So identifying that within yourself just translates then when you're growing a team and actually appointing the right candidates for the right roles. And I guess just to finalise, like, we both know how to code. Um, we both, I, I did a degree in computer science, so, so did Ravi. I was, a soft, I was a front developer, literally opposite where we started the Voilo before joining. Ravi, but what I would say is two things: is one, yes, it's there's benefits as Pam does make. Like we, I know how long things should take, so that's a benefit. Yes, yeah. do I want to code? No. Ravi directly runs the tech side, and I'll let him speak now in a second. But even in that sense, Ravi's not there coding every time because time is money. Time is the most valuable asset. We can pay someone a lot less to do that job than it is to sit on a... I couldn't hire someone from India to sit on this panel right now to grow the business, just be there. Like, you just, that's not how... You can't outsource that. You can't outsource to other parts of the business, walking out to it, selling to it, getting client feedback. So that's what's going to grow the business, not me sat behind a desk. So it, th there's benefits to both. Bootstrapping, I think, is brilliant as well. So if you can code it, you're going to save a lot of money for that MVP. So it's, it's about playing play to your strengths, I think. I mean, just just a last point. Like, know your industry, 
know exactly where the future looks like coming three or five years because when you're going to have a conversation with a third party, so you know exactly what they are saying and how this looks like. So it's very much important to know the basic and overview, which depend upon the individual if they love to do that or not. Um, I would suggest getting an independent review done of your code if you are concerned about that um, and then having those contracts with that company to do that in place because that would then give you the insight that you might not have um, and then the knowledge of whether you should change to a def different developer or not. I think in terms of the code wise also you can start building the infrastructures which is required to host the code and holes that is totally under your control and if you know that if you don't know that you can take someone helps someone from expertise from the tech side who can help you to build that infrastructures and let the coder code and whatever they are coding it's in under your control I mean, that's an interesting question. I think this is where the investors are very much interested, the profitability. But it's very much important, which we believe, like to knowing the industry. Like for us as a fintech industries, it's majorly about the valuation, top line. Bottom line is a long game. And if we see other competitor, anyone, Revolut, Starling, anyone, <coughs> they're still around millions of in the laws, but their top line is there, and it's more about valuation game. But if you see the other industry, it's more about the bottom line, how much is the profits. Just it totally depend upon which sector, what exactly, and where we want to go to. Should we have some questions from the slides? Yes. Um, I guess this is kind of similar. So with the demonetization of apps these days, how do you monetize apps? I feel like maybe we've covered that, really. Yeah, I think we've covered it. How did you come across investment? Covered, I think. Yeah. Networking, etc. Um, <laughs> this one again. I think this. Yeah. How much did they cost, and how long did they take? I think we've yeah covered that. What was the cost? Yeah. How did you network, and what tips do you have for networking? That's a good one. Um, so networking is something that still doesn't really come naturally to me if I'll be honest with you like um but you have to put yourself in that position and also you have to say to yourself if people don't know what you're doing then how can they help you so you have to be visible so you even if it doesn't come naturally to you I think the more that you do it that the easier it does become and we have made some great connections and friendships through networking like Ronan my best mate here <laughs> who I met last week <laughs> Um, great connection and today would be a great connection as well but I think you it, it's that confidence it's like a muscle isn't it the more that you flex it the more that you use it the stronger it becomes but also I think when it comes to like entrepreneurship there's this kind of like narrative that you have to be like you know really confident and all the rest of it and if that's not your vibe and that's not who you are then own that and that's absolutely fine I for example I've got ADHD so I know that I can only do a bit of networking and then I get quite emotionally drained so I get energized by people but then after a networking event I'm like the next day I'm just like I feel completely drained from it so I think you just have to know yourself um but it is um, I don't even like the word networking. I, f I think it feels a little bit dated and a little bit like clinical and a bit like there's no connection there at all. Fundamentally, you're going to a room or an event and you're telling people who you are and what you do. And 
you already know what you're doing. You already know who you are. So you're just basically selling yourself. And you're going to have connections or you're going to meet people and you're going to have no kind of connection and that's fine. But then you are going to, you know, meet somebody and they could literally be like that catalyst to spur you on to your next, your next whatever business idea or the next stage of your business. So just take a day or a networking event at a time. Um. I would say get comfortable with being uncomfortable first and foremost. The second thing I would say is don't go in there and do your 60 second pitch. Listen to what the person is saying, connect with that person and then find that thing from your business that aligns with something they've said and it's not going to be with every single person that you speak to and some conversations you can cut them short politely but <laughs> If it's a case of you're just waffling and you don't really have anything to connect on, it's not the right connection for you. So feel free to move on and speak to somebody else that you might have a connection with, but don't drill down your 60 second pitch. Connect and then align something from your business with them. And I think, I guess, the tip would be start like. We got quite into network. We got, I think we we worked well. But me, people used to say me and Ravi work a room really well. I don't think that's what you say, but it was just because we're like I've talked. To, I, I live with him. I don't want to talk to him. <laughs> like, if I'm honest, I'm sick of hearing about him. So if anything, it's about okay. Actually, we both go and like, let's let's meet someone new. Let's go out. It probably does help when you have someone that you know with that like, even is there. Just so you even not to talk to again, not to talk to there, but afterwards be like. Oh, how's it going? Oh, do you want to drink and have a minute and then go back at it? We met all our investors through networking at every stage. Pretty much every success I think we've had in our business fundamentally. I, I agree. I don't like the net word networking because it feels like it's, in my mind, when I hear networking, I think a networking event where no one knows each other, you just walk in. But this is a networking event. The going for a dinner and where there's opportunities there. Go, there's at St. Paul Square, that in, there's always seems to be an event on there, which is some sort of networking event, but it's just a case for people to socialize and you never know, having those conversations, building up that, those contacts, people or often people know people who can help you. And I think the, something someone said, I have puppy dog energy sometimes. So I get so excited, but <laughs> people buy into that. And that's the beauty of where everyone is in this room. I imagine is, is that it's all potential. So why not just get really excited by it? Share what your your vision is. Again, it's not about selling your six, six seconds. It's about selling what what do you believe in and seeing who who bounces off that and then see where it goes. I mean, just uh, like last point, like someone said, like it's not about what we do; it's about who do we know. So that's exactly that network effect helps. And sometimes, I mean, for us, it helps a lot. Like who do we know? And and we should not be ashamed of asking a help because there are people around our network who have many things. So if you are struggling with anything, just ask. And there are, the, and I always say, like for me, Birmingham, I see as a Silicon Valley of UK. It's more of a let's grow together. So there are people and organizations. If you take one step, they help. They happy to take another two step. I guess just one recommendation, I'd say, is a really good one for even at this stage is Tech Wednesday, which is literally down tomorrow. the. Which was tomorrow. There you go. Uh, in terms of turnaround, is that's a really good event, I think, because it's people in the tech space right mindset, very casual, very friendly, and they have loads of pizza. So there's, <laughs> there's a benefit there, if nothing else. That's in um, Innovation Birmingham campus, is it an eye centrum. If you, if you Google that, you'll be able to find out who's Yeah, it's just literally yeah, around the corner. I think there's lots of examples, and I'm always happy to share at the, at the different stages, but I think that's a good entry-level one because it's just quite a friendly environment. There you go. There it is. Okay, uh, we can share the links of these things as well afterwards. Well, I have one question. What were your biggest fears during your whole development process? You must have had fears, difficulties. What would you think of these fears? I don't, you know what? So for me, um, I think fears... Um, so for me... I like to think of myself as fearless to an extent. Understand that fear is an emotion, but understanding what to do with it and not letting that take over you. So any fear that I've had in this journey, I've taken it as an opportunity to grow 
And I think if you could switch that in your mind, it it's powerful. I mean, like personally for me, I'm a big believer of law of attraction. So whatever we attract, we'll get. If we more attract the fear, they will fear. If we attract no, there will be no nothing as such of fear. I will find the solution and get it sorted. So automatically that energy will give that and it will get them. I guess that Ravi is not wasting all our money. It, it was my biggest fear. But no, it is. There's a fit. There's always going to be a fit. Are they going to get it right? The answer is no. Is is the bottom line? But you. So that's you might as well accept that. Accept that fear. I think that's sort of what everyone's sort of saying. Yeah. Don't be scared. Just do it. <laughs> and I think also it's really important that you expect to fail at some point. Yeah. And then also again, it's like that switching that mindset and yeah your ego is going to get bruised because everybody wants to do things right the first time but one thing that I've learned is that you know we just need to give ourselves a little bit more grace because we're starting doing something for the first time it's a little bit like toddlers you know when they're learning to walk and they fall over then they just get back up and they try again I mean we don't see many 19 year olds still trying to learn to walk because they never got off the floor do you know I mean they constantly are like okay I'm going to try again learn from your mistakes but then just also learn from them really quickly <laughs> I just want to add one point. Uh, Master Sanvi is like the CEO of SoftBank who already has many shares in all the tech companies. So he, one time he said, just accept what will happen in the worst situation. Accept that. Nothing, gonna bad, nothing bad is going to happen beyond that. And when you start doing that, okay, what else you can do to not happen that? So automatically things will work. And just one extra thing to that is consumption. What are you consuming? So think about your motivational speakers, um, your self-help <coughs> books, um, mindset, things like that. If you consume more of that, your mindset is more triggered to solution-orientated um, mindset rather than fear-orientated and problem-driven. Okay, um, so how do you integrate your idea into an app and how do you build an app? I think, I don't know if anyone wants to own up to this question and explain a bit more, but I feel like it might be asking about kind of the design of it and maybe translating your ideas actually into the design of the app and the kind of UX and the flow and, and how did you kind of go about that? I think that's what that means, unless anyone wants to... I think you kind of described it. You have an idea. <laughs> um, you get um, you get somebody to code it. You look at your MVP. You test it. You go through your pilot testing. You get your customer feedback. You make those iterations into what the customers actually want, um, and then you market it and you launch. <laughs> In a nutshell. Easy. <laughs> yeah. Think. Yeah. Okay. Unless anyone wants to elaborate, I'll move on. Um, is it all right to launch a business idea without having a USB? USP, sorry. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you can. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, in this day and age, especially in this digital world that we're living in, I personally think that you need to have a USP. But I also think that it doesn't need to be like this grand thing that no one's ever heard about. It's, it's your business, it's your idea, and how are you differentiating yourself from the competition? It could be something quite minimal, but at the same time, as your company grows and the business grows and the idea grows, that's going to transcend to be something a lot different to what your competitors are doing. I do think that you do need a USB. It could be something, not even the tech side of it, it could be like you personally, your business, what you stand for. Um, so yeah, you can, but um, for us, we were always thinking, how can we be different? What's going to make somebody pick up a book and be like, I want to download the app? Yeah, because it's this time to get your phone out and download it. So we want to make sure we're giving someone that incentive because they see the vision and they are curious. And then after they've done it, they've been like, wow, okay, I want to do that again. So that's my answer. I think personally, I'd pretty much echo um, everything there. Like, I don't think you can launch. I think, like, obviously, legally, we've disagreed. We can, but I think like if it like you need a USB, but it does. As I think it's just absolutely right. It doesn't have to be the tech, but you really should be at least the way you market the way you whoever your target market is. Maybe the foundation of the tech's been done before, but where can you then start to differ differentiate? Like we're not the first people to do a payment system. 
Um, but we found the niche, we found our, our, our value add, we found our market. And I think one thing, I guess, we might have learned, maybe through, or especially, I, we say, because our costs are so low, we save 90%. We're like, that's a brilliant USP, but actually cost, while it's a brilliant value add, it's a brilliant cherry on top, it should never be your USP because someone can always go, go in, make something slightly worse and slightly cheaper, especially in tech. So I guess that's the only additional, is don't allow that to be your USP. Oh, sorry. Um, one. Ooh, according to you, is it simpler to provide seller service via the app compared to selling a physical product? Depends <laughs> what, because service and product two totally different things. Mm. So I yeah, know I don't know what these to... can can say really. Any thoughts? Yeah, I was going to say, because we do both. We've got the physical hard copy of books, but yeah. then we've got the service side where we can convert other people's books into the AR experience. So as, again, a bit of our USB is that we are fusing the two worlds together. So you, the app won't work without the book, because otherwise it would just be an app on your phone. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I completely forgot the question. I'm oh, sorry, I got rid of Yeah. <laughs> Um, so for us, it, it's it, the two work hand in hand. They get the book, they see you can get a, an app, they get the app, they use the book, then they're like, I want another book. Um, and so it's kind of like, it's a loop circle for us. Okay. Um, creating a community online is not easy. People need to feel the value, especially if they're paying a monthly subscription. How long does it take to create a solid platform? <laughs> <laughs> so community is massive for us it's actually one of our foundational values and so that's why we have our dedicated community section in the app where they can set up group calls with each other we set up group calls we have um, our experts and our professionals like we had a um, our one of our hypnotherapists come on explain what hypnotherapy is um, do a session which adds value and it's constantly adding value you in different ways for us on our community section um, and it you're always going to build to creating a solid platform there's still going to be some um, unsteady footing there but it's going to continue to grow and that solid platform comes over time and that time is specific to your app and how much actually you put in to create in that community. Good. Um, so, so, why the name Boilo? Um, so it comes from two words, the voice of local. Um, fundamentally why we started this was because we found that there was that disparagement about the big business, the small business, and we wanted to say how can we allow those local businesses, your charities, to connect to their customers. So that's why the name Voilo, I have to say, it gets mispronounced a fair few, a fair <laughs> bit. So uh, it's one of the fun challenges we're facing right now. Okay. Um, in terms of deciding to implement an idea, why choose an app over a website? Why did you choose an app? We wanted to kind of move with the times everybody's got a tablet or an iphone and although people do have laptops the bigger the hard to lug around um and your phone it's always on you always doesn't matter where you are you don't always take your laptop so for us that was one of the key motivators to having an app over um a website yeah, last one, this no more. Very last question. <laughs> so, how would you protect a guide based business, e.g., providing yeah, a guide to starting a business? So, yeah, like a content heavy business, I guess. How do you, what are your thoughts on protecting that? Maybe having a member only section on your web website where they have to log in to access the content. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or not. <laughs> Brilliant. So I think um, we ought to have a quick round of applause for our friends. <laughs>